Thank you, Beverly, for the beautiful prelude. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you here. I know we uh, have uh, visitors and members that are with us here uh, today, and we also have uh, some of our members who are joining us through Facebook Live, and so we just want to extend a warm welcome to everyone here. Uh, and for those who are visiting uh, and you're looking for a church home, I would uh, highly recommend and strongly suggest uh, Scottsville Thunderbird Church. Um, as, um, as we gather together and uh, we're here, you know, times are different, and so our services are, are a little condensed. But it's good to be in God's house, and it's good to be fellowshipping together with one, one another. Um, this morning, uh, just a quick announcement. Uh, we have uh, just a first reading uh, to make you uh, aware uh, of Stephen Wirtz uh, from Simi Valley SDA Church uh, to Scottsdale Thunderbird Church. So that's just the first reading. Uh, we'll have a, a second reading next Sabbath. Um, our pastor um, is, as some of you might know, uh, some of you might not know, he uh, was uh, traveling here to move, move here, and uh, he had some car problems on his way. So he went back this week to pick up his car, so he will be with, with us next Sabbath. Um, so we're really excited about that. We're also excited that school is going to be starting, and we want to just remember our schools, remember our students and our teachers, and keep them in prayer uh, as we... Uh, start this new school year, uh, both for TCE and for TAA. Uh, so uh, those, those are the announcements uh, for, for this morning. Uh, just wanted to make you aware of those. So at this time, I would invite you to uh, bow your heads as we have a word of prayer to begin. Our Father in heaven, we come before your throne of grace, giving you thanks for the way that you have watched over us, for blessing us, uh, and for another Sabbath day that we can come, Lord, into your presence, rejoicing uh, and resting in the confidence that we are saved through you and through your merits alone. Father, as we gather together this morning, we pray for your Holy Spirit, not to just fill this building, but to fill our hearts to come in and dwell within us. We ask a special blessing over Zach as he brings us the message. We're always blessed by having him here and, and just pray that you would just work through him uh, this uh, morning as he brings us the message from on high. Father, we just uh, pray for um, our, our leaders, pray for uh, just the turbulent times that we live in, and just pray that uh, through it all we might have the assurance knowing that Jesus is coming soon and that uh, you have things under control. So, Father, we just give you thanks and invite your spirit to be with us. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Since it is condensed, you're going to see me here. I'm just going to stand here, get a couple of things done. And so... Um, this time is our time for our offering and just want to make you aware that so this is for our church budget. Um, and so what we're doing because we're trying to social distance is um, we have uh, a box, I think. We still should have a box up front that should be collected. So when you leave, you can just put your tithe envelopes in the box up front. That way we're kind of keeping a little bit of distance. Um, but our... Uh, Offering uh, for church budget, just want to make you aware. So last year, um, we had a couple of things that, that took place. And I don't believe that we ever mentioned it to our church family, but our air conditioning system went down in the fellowship, uh, and so we had to replace that. So um, church board, we made decisions, and we, we got, got it taken care of and, and got repaired. Um, and so, so that was great. And I know many of you probably haven't been, or how many, how, let me ask you, how many of you have seen the new flooring in the fellowship hall? Okay, so some of, some of us have. Um, so anyway, the, we've got new flooring in there. So the carpet that's been there since, oh, I don't know how long, but for a very long time, I was uh, taken out, and we have now a new uh, v uh, vinyl flooring. It looks very nice, and I think it should be very durable. Uh, it should last us for, for quite a while. So um, those are two kind of expenditures that we had last year that really weren't uh, planned on, uh, I would say, but it was just something that we felt that we needed to do. So uh, I would remind you and just kind of just put that uh, into your hearts to if you uh, want to give, designate that uh, for um, in your offerings for that, um, that would be greatly appreciated. Um, at this time, uh, let's pray for the, uh, our tithes and offerings. Father, we give you thanks for the way that you have blessed us. And um, Lord, we just pray that uh, you would be with us, uh, pray that uh, you would... Uh, be with our finances uh, for our schools and everything else that we do here uh, at Scottsdale Thunderbird Church. Uh, we give you thanks because you have come through time and time again. And so we just give you thanks for that and just pray that you would be with our members, um, be with their faithfulness uh, as they return their tithes and offerings to you. 
Um, pray, Father, for just as we move forward at this new school year that you would be with us um, and that you would just provide and, and guidance and wisdom as that we make good, good decisions as we move forward. Um, again, Lord, um, you own everything, and we just pray that you would give us um, your spirit to be able to be gracious as you are gracious to us. And uh, we thank this in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm going to be singing the Lord's Prayer this morning. Uh, I'm singing a version of it that's just slightly different for some of you music purists. When you hear me singing it, you might think that's not the Lord's Prayer. It's just a little bit different. But it was a, an arrangement uh, very similar to the original, but it was sung by a group called In Unity uh, about 20 years ago. There was about 10 of them when they sung it. I'm going to try to do this by myself. So, um, but um, it is a short song, about 60 seconds, but uh, that's it, the shortest special music you'll ever hear. So enjoy for the honor and glory of the Lord. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be. Thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors Ooh. and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory Have your Bibles with you, I invite you to turn to Psalm 92. We'll be reading verses 12 to 14, or if you have your phones or whatever a Bible app you use, I invite you to follow along with me. Verse 12, the righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bear fruit in old age, they shall be fresh and flourishing. Good morning, church family. Sorry about my hair this morning, just kind of woke up like this. I'm thankful that, uh, like Samson, the power is not in the hair, it's in the spirit. Amen. <laughs> We're going to pray for the spirit this morning. Um, I would like to um, just quickly, before we get started, um, recognize the uh, Egwu family this morning. If you haven't heard, uh, Quincy Egwu was a um, powerful uh, young adult in our church community here in the Arizona area. Um, he was found, um, well, he passed away, uh, what we think yesterday, um, in the White Tank Mountains, um, they believe to be hiking. So the cause for death is still um, unknown, but, you know, he left behind his um, newly wedded wife and I believe their child who's about nine months old. So um, I mentioned that because I, I don't know if we can post it on the Scottsdale Thunderbird church page, or I guess I can post it later on Facebook today, but there is a 
a slot where you can donate um, to support the memorial for his family. And I'm sure anything can help. They've raised plenty in such a short amount of time, but I'm sure they could use any additional support from their you know, Valley Church family. Um, and I want to go ahead and say a prayer just for the family this morning um, as we get started. Uh, let's go ahead and pray. Uh, Father in heaven, we thank you so much uh, just for this beautiful Sabbath day. And this morning, we want to take in consideration the Egu family, um, just everyone, the whole family, Del Rose, Jeremy, uh, Cynthia, uh, their little one, and just everybody who's being affected by the loss of Quincy, who is such a powerful uh, person in our community. Um, Lord, we ask that your blessing be upon the family, uh, your healing power be with them, and we pray that you encourage them in this season. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 3 this morning if you want to uh, join me. If you're up at Camp Yavapines, I know the Cortads were there, you'll kind of get a, um, a little uh, similar of what was uh, shared, this, shared there. So I'm just kind of sharing from my, from my heart this morning. But yeah, Quincy was an incredible person. He, uh, when I first became a Christian or a Seventh-day Adventist, I went on a, a mission trip to the Dominican Republic, and Quincy was my roommate. And he was just such an awesome guy. So just such a blessing, so nice, so joyful. And so I'm just, yeah, thinking about him a lot, uh, I guess, this morning. Um, Matthew chapter 3, I want to share a little bit more about with you guys this morning about this idea of identity, the importance of identity and understanding not just who we are, but whose we are. Um, I've had a lot of time this um, break, you know, to catch up on all my uh, TV shows. And one of those TV shows that um, Coach Alex had just been, was pestering me about all through the summer was this documentary called The Last Dance that followed kind of like Michael Jordan's early career. I'm not into sports. I know absolutely nothing about sports. But now I think I'm going to be a sports fan for the rest of my life. Um, amen. Yes. Uh, because of that documentary. What it does is it follows MJ's early, I'm gonna to refer to him as MJ because we're cool like that, um, MJ's early career um, with the Chicago Bulls and just like his transition from struggling, like I didn't know this, and this gives me hope from all, for all of our high school freshmen who don't make the basketball team, but this guy didn't even make the basketball team his freshman year. And to me, there's just, the story is absolutely incredible. Um, and uh, there's this one portion in, his, in the documentary that really stood out to me where he, is, where he retires a little bit early. So uh, the documentary just talks about how Michael Jordan's dad had a huge impact on his life, um, how his dad kind of helped bring the best out of him. His dad was always there for him during his games. Um, his dad saw him during the playoffs. His dad was there for his victories. Just these crazy important moments that showed how much um, his dad was involved with his sort of success story. Um, well, his dad passed away in the, uh, in the, in the series. It, it, it talks about it. But when he comes out of retirement, he comes back with a new jersey. He went from the number 23 to the number 45. And what is so trippy about this idea, you may not find this mind-blowing, but I do, is how he played with the number 45 versus how he performed with the number 23 and trying to understand this new identity in the NBA when he had come back to play again. And there, I was like reading the statistics, like his, his three point uh, shot went up certain percent, like three, four, five, six percent, but his actual performance, his overall performing actually went down, they said, um, according to his like two point stats, uh, his two point game, like anywhere down to like almost 10%. And it was crazy because he was trying to rediscover this new identity after coming out of retirement to go into this thing. But what he found was going back to the old number, number 23, conjured up this idea of a better identity with his father that allowed him to keep performing at such a great level. It was absolutely just mind-blowing how something, it seemed as significant as a number that's related to not just who we are, but whose we are, his father, really helped him once again to get going. Well, in Matthew chapter 3, we see something just as similar, sim similar and just as powerful. The Bible says in Matthew 3, I'm starting in verse 13, that Jesus came to Galilee 
uh, to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. And John tried to prevent him saying, I need to be baptized by you and you're the one coming to me? It was like a flip the switch thing. It was completely mind blowing to him. He says, wait a minute, I am sinful. There is nothing great about me and yet you're coming to me for this thing? It should be the other way around. You're God, you need to be forgiving me. You're God, you need to serve me. Why are you asking me to do this thing? What I love about this experience and what this testifies to the fact of is that God doesn't necessarily need us. God invites us into this experience with him. It doesn't really matter if we're holier than thou or where we've been or what we've done. As John the Baptist just preaches, you need to baptize me. Like, I am unworthy to do something like this for you. But Jesus' response is completely, it, it's just really eye-opening. Jesus answered and said to him, Permit it to be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. And then he allowed him. Now this is crazy. This may mean nothing to you, but it means so much to me. He told John the Baptist that this was fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. He didn't say, I need you to do this for me, he didn't say, this is about me. He said, this is about us. We are a part of this thing, and he invites him into this experience with it. This is what I love about the journey of righteousness. It doesn't involve just God doing something. He invites us into it to be a part of it. It involves an us. So it's not just about who we are, but what we're about to see, whose we are. So it continues on in verse 16. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open to him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove almighty upon him. And suddenly this voice came from heaven, verse 17, saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now here's what's crazy. Jesus didn't do anything amazing. Like Jesus wasn't sinful and he had to repent. And Jesus is like, oh, welcome to the kingdom. This is awesome. All Jesus did was publicly identify himself with him. And to God, that was pleasing. When our identity is found in him, when we so publicly identify ourselves with him, to God, that is what is well-pleasing. So often in the Christian experience, and I know I, I teach uh, students, and so this comes across often, but if God already forgives me, like if God already died for me and God already loves me, then what, what, what do I need to do? Why do, I need to why do I need to do anything? Like God already did everything. But the difference here Jesus lays out in the Christian journey, the difference is, is not just what God did for us, but what God wants to do with us. And the beauty of this idea, not only what he wants to do with us, but how he identifies himself with us. That he is one of us. When I was at PUC and I was on the soccer team, playing college soccer was one of the hardest and most difficult things that ever happened to me. And I remember one time my coach just lit into me. He was a non-Adventist coach. Um, this was at PUC, I love PUC. Um, but he just laid into me and I remember almost walking off that soccer field. I remember walking away almost in tears crying because of the way he was addressing me. And then one of my, um, one of my teammates stood up and called out the coach on that. And he says, hey, like, like, that's not right. Like, Zach, like, you can't talk to him like that. Like, Zach, like, don't listen to what he's, he identified himself with me. And in that moment, it gave me confidence because it showed me I'm not alone in this. It's not just up to me. It is God with me. A big part of understanding our identity is just not, it's not just who we are, but whose we are. We belong to him, and there's something special in that community. Um, I'm sure you guys have heard the story or the illustration of the, uh, the son who died in battle. His father was an art collector, and he collected pieces from all over the world, beautiful pieces of art. And when his son who had died in battle, his best friend goes to meet his father. 
to give his father something in remembrance of his son because that was his best friend. And so what he gives to the father is his own painting because this guy's, the son's best friend was into drawing. He was into art. He was an artist. So he began painting, he began drawing, or whatever, this image of the sun. But of course, it wasn't an exact image of the sun. It kind of looked like him, but it looked like a grade schooler maybe sketched this image of him. But the father takes it, and he says, thank you. And he moves one of his world-renowned paintings that he collected. He moved it out of the way and hung up the picture of the sun. So it was in the center of everything. Well, when the father passed away, he had no inheritance to give. And so the city was auctioning off all of this material, all of these paintings. And of course, the story goes that as the auction was beginning, the, the, uh, the auctioneer gets up front, and what's first to go is the picture of the sun. And so he tells all of the people who are attending, the attendants, if you would like to begin this auction, this is the first piece that has to go. And it was the best friend's drawing of the sun. And it wasn't anything amazing, it wasn't spectacular, it wasn't even beautiful. And so everyone who was there was ready to spend big money. And they're like, that's a waste of my hard un money. I don't want to spend any money on that. But when the best friend heard about the auction, he wanted to go to see if he can get something of remembrance of them. So he was there and of course he raised his hand and he said, I would like to buy that piece. This was his piece. And he heard everybody talking smack and trash about his piece. Oh, it's ugly. There's nothing special about it. Why would you even waste money on it? And he goes, it's the person. It's who that person represents. That's I belong to. So he raises his hand and he says, I'll, I have 75 cents or a dollar or something. Of course, the auctioneer says, all right, going once, going twice. The image gets sold for about 75 cents or a dollar. To which then the auctioneer says, all right, this bidding is over. It's done. And everyone was at a, you know, in an uproar. Why would it be done? Like, what, why would you finish it? There's still so many beautiful pieces left. And he says, well, it was in the will of the Father. And it says here in the image, um, on the back of the image, that he who gets the Son gets it all. He who gets the Son gets it all. You see, it's not just about who we are, but whose we are. And because he identified himself with the son, it wasn't just another number. It wasn't just another picture. It was what came along with that, all the things that came with it, because he identified himself with it. And so he walked away with all of that. You see, for MJ, number 23 wasn't just another number. It conjured up an important identity about his father. And in this experience with Jesus, what's so important for him is what his father said about him. And what his father said about him is that he is beloved, that he belongs to him, and that he is well pleased with him, even though Jesus didn't do any amazing thing beside identify himself with him. And so what we see very quickly in Matthew chapter 4, if you're following, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. The Bible says that after that experience, Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted or tested by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he became hungry. I remember when I was here at Thunderbird Academy, I did this thing called the Daniel Diet, the Daniel Challenge. It was the worst experience of my entire life. I was starving. I was so hungry. Um, it was miserable. I was like, I don't feel closer to God. I feel angry at God. Jesus was hungry. So when the tempter came to him, he said, if you are the son of God, command these stones become bread. Just a moment ago, God said, you are my son. And now just a moment later, he's saying, if you are the son. But notice Jesus does it. The enemy does it when Jesus is hungry. If you want to get a terrible reaction out of me, do it when I'm hungry. Do it right after I get done teaching, what is it, fourth period, um, right before lunch. That's when you don't ask me favors. You do it after lunch. Um, I am hungry. Now, here's what's crazy about this experience, is the devil comes at us when we are hungry, when we are spiritually starving, when we are struggling physically, emotionally, mentally, financially, then the devil comes to you and me and he says, well, if you really were the son or the daughter of God, 
then you would be able to do this thing, or this thing would not be happening to you. He makes us begin to doubt our identity. Well, if you really were a son or daughter of God, you wouldn't be doing that thing because the Father would provide you with what you, with what you need. But what Jesus says is so powerful. He says it is written, verse 4, Man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He had a hunger for something not physical, but spiritual. You know, something that I'm coming to the conclusion of in my Christian walk is that the Christian experience is not just about denying things. It's about delighting yourself in the right things. When Jesus met a woman at the well who was thirsty, she was hungry, she was struggling, the Bible says Jesus' interaction with her fed him. It fulfilled him. So when he walked away from that experience, the Bible says he was satisfied even though he had been walking, even though he had been journeying, even though at one point he was hungry, this interaction with this woman left something that was fulfilling and lasting. So when his disciples had come to him and approached him, they were like, Jesus, we have food for you. But he's like, I'm not hungry. Like, when, when did you eat? He said, I have food of which you do not know. I have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word which proceeds from the mouth of God. You got to follow me this morning. When God said, let there be light, when he used that same word to declare there to be light, the world didn't have to believe that there was light. The world was at the mercy of the command, let there be light. So when our heavenly father says we are a son and a daughter of his, that we belong to him, that we so identify ourselves with him, we don't have to believe it. We receive it. It's not up to us to believe. The condition is not upon whether we believe. Like the man who is struggling, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. We just receive. This idea of belief is one of the things that hurts the Christian faith so much that Pastor Zach, I believe in God, but nothing amazing is happening. Your duty is not simply to believe, it's to receive and walk in the identity of what the Father is saying. We're at the mercy of what he says. It's not our responsibility to make sure we believe it hard enough, trust well enough. We receive it and we choose daily by faith to walk in it, to continue in it. That series with MJ is just so mind-blowing. There was another episode, and I'm not going to give it away. If you haven't watched it, you got to see it, where he was having another, you know, he was, he was struggling in another one of his performances, when, or one of another, a game that he, when he had came out of retirement during a playoff season, and people thought, oh, he's just getting older. <laughs> he's getting weaker. He's just getting tired. He shouldn't have come out of retirement. We're going to show MJ he should have stayed in retirement. But when they were interviewing MJ about it, he laughed. And he said, no, I was struggling because it was Father's Day. And I was remembering my father that day. He so identified himself with a father that he lived with him. He was one with him. We have to identify ourselves with what God says about us. Daily, even if we begin to doubt it, we receive it. It's not our responsibility to have enough belief to be able to believe it. It's simply to trust and to receive it. That's all we can do, but we have to walk in it. We have to walk in it. Um, there's a story in closing. I wish it would have been Numbers chapter 23, but it's Numbers chapter 24. Um, 23 would have been a cool, cool way to end it. But Numbers chapter 24 is really eye-opening. Balaam, this prophet, was sent to curse the nation of Israel because Balak, the king of Moab, was scared. They were, they were coming to conquer him. Long story short, Balaam's this prophet, this diviner, this sorcerer who was meant to curse Israel. But he can't curse them. All he can do is say what the Father says about them. In verse 1, the Bible says, Now when Balaam saw... And number 24, when Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel, he did not go as at other times to seek to use sorcery, but he set his face toward the wilderness. 
And Balaam raised his eyes and saw Israel encamped according to their tribes. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon him. He's supposed to curse them, but he ends up blessing them. Verse 3, he took up his oracle and said, The utterance of Balaam, the son of Beor, the utterance of a man whose eyes are open, the utterance of him who hears the words of God, who sees the vision of the Almighty, who falls down with eyes wide open. This is what I say, verse 5. How lovely are your tents, O Jacob, your dwellings, O Israel, like valleys that stretch out, like gardens by the riverside, like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. This is what's crazy about this experience, is what God says about them and Israel's opportunity to identify with what God is saying. First of all, God says, how lovely are your tents? Whew. I don't know about you, but I just finished camping, and tents aren't that lovely, right? I went camping this weekend, or uh, last weekend, and I uh, forgot my ground pad. I didn't have a ground pad for my sleeping bag. I didn't have my bougie blow-up mattress. Um, I didn't have anything. I was sleeping on the hard ground. It was really rough. So when God says, how lovely are your tents, O Jacob, what is he doing? God is comparing. Israel had just come out of Egypt where they had no real estate. They had no property. What they had was what was given to them, but now they have tents. You see, they can take up real estate. Why? Because the Bible says they now have property. God says in verse 5, your dwellings, O Israel, they are lovely. Check this out. You have valleys that stretch out. You see, just a moment ago, Israel was stuck in Egypt, crammed into the tight spaces of the city. But now they have real estate in the valley. This was given to them. And so sometimes we look at our lives and we're like, man, what I have, ha, huh, doesn't feel lovely. But it's so much better than from where we were coming. He says, you are like gardens by the riverside. You are like aloes planted by the Lord, like cedars beside the waters. So um, I'm going to share this quote that I read um, from Patriarchs and Prophets about this passage. passage specifically. It's beautiful. Um, the author says this, the prosperity of God's people is here represented by some of the most beautiful figures to be found in nature. The prophet likens Israel to fertile valleys covered with harvests, to flourishing gardens watered by never failing springs, to fragrant sandal trees and the stately cedar. The figure last mentioned though, is the most strikingly beautiful and appropriate to be found in the word of God. The cedar of Lebanon was honored by all the people of the east. You see, this class of trees to which it belongs is found wherever man has gone. From the Arctic regions to the tropic zones, they flourish. They rejoice in the heat and brave the cold. They spring in rich luxuriance by the riverside and tower aloft above the thirsty wasteland. They plant their roots deep among the rocks of the mountains and boldly stand in defiance against the tempest. Their leaves are fresh, their leaves are green, and when all else has perished and breathed its last in winter, above all, these trees, the cedar of Lebanon, is distinguished then in those moments by its strength, its firmness, its vigor, and this is used as a symbol for those whose life is hid in Christ, says the scriptures, the righteous will grow like the cedars. You see, the divine hand is exalted, has exalted the cedar as king over the forest. Ezekiel says the fir trees were not like its bows and the chestnut trees were not like its branches, nor any tree in the garden of God. The cedar is repeatedly employed as an emblem of royalty. And God likens us un. To these trees despite us doing anything. What do we do? We keep identifying, we keep abiding, and we keep remaining. The promise is found here in Psalms 92 verses 12 through 14. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those who are planted, planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of God. They shall bear fruit despite their old age. They shall be fresh and they shall always be flourishing. Even though we're getting older, 
we're getting better. As Paul says, even though our bodies are wasting away day by day, inwardly we're being renewed every single day. From moment to moment, from glory to glory, from victory from vi to victory, we identify ourselves not by just a number, but by what God is saying. So anytime someone comes to me, they say, Zach, you're looking a little tired. Zach, your flames burning out and I see you struggling. I remind myself that even the youth grow weary. The young men, as the Bible says, shall utterly fall, but those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings like eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall walk and never faint. Never mistake someone struggling for someone who's not waiting. Because in the waiting, the Bible says a season will come where we, where we will begin soaring. Our secret, the secret is we keep identifying. What the Father says about us is so much better than what the enemy is offering us. Thank you, Pastor Zach, for reminding us of who we, who we are, who our identity lies with. Let us, uh, let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your great love, for your compassion, for your mercy, for all that you do for us and what you say about us. And so, for, Father, we just give you thanks and pray that you would be with us this coming week. May that identity and that knowledge we have of what you say about us be something that we take uh, uh, shelter in, and it be something that we share with others, that they and their identities, Lord, is not found by what our circumstances or other things that happen around us, but it's but our belief in what you say about us. So, Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Be with us this week. Pray that uh, you would continue to uh, send your spirit to abide with us and to draw us closer to you. And this is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.